Hi everybody, I'm Pablo Zacarias, project manager of Latin Coover, and I'm very happy to have you all here on our webinar, uh, part of the ADAPT uh, web series, webinar series, uh, presented by the Latin Canadian Business Network. Our topic today is gonna be mastering your retirement in any market condition. Retirement is quite a topic, and even though you're young and happy and handsome, you might face uh, sooner than later your retirement. So uh, please, I would like to welcome our guests, uh, Sara Koshnavasi and Sheldon Lau from IG Wealth Management. Uh, are you there? Thank Good you. afternoon, everybody. Good Thank you. Hi, Sheldon. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. And as you heard the other voice, that was uh, Sara on the line as well. Yeah, sorry, there's no video for me today, but uh, just sound. <laughs> Sarah, thanks for being here too. We, we can hear you loud and clear. So I'll leave it to you, Sheldon. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen here and we can get started. All righty. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for taking the time out of your days to be a part of this presentation titled Mastering Your Retirement in Any Market Condition. Also, I would like to make a special thank you to Axel and the entire, entire LCBN community for making this possible. It's no surprise to anybody that these last few months have allowed us to experience some events that were previously unheard of. From a global shutdown to a stock market crash and everything in between, we have been able to experience this and get through this together as a community. First and foremost, I'd like to introduce myself as Pablo did so nicely. My name is Sheldon Lal and I'm a consultant for IG Wealth Management. I'm joined today by my fearless director and certified financial planner, Sara Koshnabasi. Also looking after the entire greater Vancouver region, we have our regional director Jason Hackett who unfortunately couldn't join us here today but he's always more than happy to meet and chat with new people. I'll spend some time in the latter part of today's webinar talking about our support team and their roles in our robust financial planning. As I said earlier uh, and I'm sure you all saw on the invitation to today's presentation it's titled Mastering Your Retirement in Any Market Condition. And I know that might be just the catchiest name you've ever heard, but it's also a very important name. When you think about mastering something, you want to master an event or a skill that's very, very close to your heart. Retirement is and should be one of these events. It's a journey that everyone and anyone is going to endure only once. And it's the longest journey that you will ever take in your life. Today's seminar, we'll talk about how you can use this holistic financial planning to help weather for the storm and set sights on some clear sales. Probably one of the most used term in the financial word world today is market volatility. It might sound ironic, but it's very true when it comes to saying the only constant is change when it comes to market volatility. Now, what do we mean when we say market volatility? Well, we mean ups and downs in the markets, how quickly things can change from a climbing mountain peak to the valley of the depths on the market charts. Okay, I know, very, very bold, bold title, but it's important that we talk about some of the things that led up to where we are right now. For the last 11 years, we've been seeing and enjoying the largest economic expansion in history. It's also called a bull market. Now I'm going to take a quick, quick stop right here and give everybody a fun little fact if they might not know it already. We refer to a strong rising, bull, a strong rising market as a bull market and a falling, declining market as a bear market. Because if anybody's been lucky enough to see a bull strike prey, you can know that the bull swings its head upwards with its horns and a bear will swing its paw downwards to strike prey. And that's what we call the patterns in the market. Swinging upwards bull, swinging downwards bear. Okay, so enough fun facts for everybody. But before we saw this 11 year bull run, the S&P 500 was in the midst of the housing crash and it was down over 50% as of March, 2009. 
The belief was, as the title says, capitalism had failed us. The evidence was we were using taxpayer dollars to bail out the global financial system. But as you can see, that forecast of the world ending and the death of capitalism, that's not right. The forecast was not true. And since that fateful March day, the markets have been up over 350%. And that's the sort of sentiment that's been left in the markets today. Many, many investors live in the constant fear of this next crisis, what's going to happen. And we've had many events, too many to count, where in their moment of time, these events seemed like permanent barriers to financial success. But in each one of these instances and many others, the first reaction of the stock markets to go down, but it's cyclical and it takes time, but the markets always come back up. And over this cycle, the markets have continued to reach new highs and break new barriers after each and every one of these events. And now, that's the question. Where are we now? Well, we're experiencing a new exogenous shock called coronavirus. And how bad will, will it get? And I want to offer that not only in the context of a healthcare scare, but also how bad will it get in the stock market? Because recently, we've experienced tremendous amounts of volatility. So I'd want to present to you a short-term model of how we try to look and make sense of this world. And this is that model. I know it's breathtaking <laughs> and joking, but this is that model of how we try to make sense about everything. And let's chat about it for a second. Throughout history, equity markets like the S&P 500 of what we've been talking about has experienced a crazy amount of ups and downs, a crazy amount of volatility. Yet despite this, the markets continue to be resilient. For instance, take this graph. The graph starts at 1956, way, way back in the day. And in 1956, till now, the S&P 500 has averaged every year about 9%, 8.93%, or so around 9% every year. But what it's also trying to show you is with the chart on the right, those are every single event where the market's gone down more than 10%. And if you can count really quickly, it's 24 events. There's been 24 events since 1959 where the markets have gone down more than 10%. But as you can see, the overall trend of the market is upwards. So it's very, very important that even through these periods of volatilities, as an investor, you stay fully invested. So you're able to recover from these periods and achieve your long-term goals. Now, to break this down and give a really, really insightful look on these events year by year, if Sara can speak a bit more to that, I will be more than happy to have that. Sara? Hi, I'm here. Thanks, Sheldon. Um, I'm just going to, uh, okay, there you go. So like Sheldon was saying, we've had many events in the past, and I'm sure everybody knows that because it's no secret that we've got uh, the, this Corona market crash, we had the 2008 crash, we've had the 2001 crash, and, and it, it's definitely, it's something that happens quite often. There's a common quote that financial planners love to throw around that says, every 10 years, we've got a crash, or every 10 to 12 years. So this is something I think a few people have been um, kind of waiting for and expecting. But the real question is, uh, how, how do we get out of this? And how, how do we survive this? So just like Sheldon was saying, the main, uh, the main way to survive these events is to stay focused and to stay invested in the long term. The, it's it's uh, actually statistically proven that investors who are trying to time the market are the ones that actually have the lowest annual return uh, yields. And so actually this slide is really interesting because you can see all the gray squares, which is all the years in the market that uh, went down. So this is when at the end of the year, um, the market closed with a negative uh, percentage. So you can see there's a few gray squares in the middle there between zero and negative 10%, but there's way more blue squares where the year ended positive. So 
we can say historically that in the last hundred years, we've, we know for sure that we have way more positive experiences than negative experiences. Uh, and, and if we're talking technically here, we're about 75% of the time positive. So it's really easy to focus on the, to focus on the negative and forget the good times, because I guess that's how the human brain works. You know, when you go to a restaurant and you don't like the food, you're going to tell everybody not to go there, but when, when you really like the food, you, you might not even mention it to someone, but just remember you like it. So we tend to focus on the, on the hard times a little bit more, but it's important to remember that we do have more positive experiences in the stock market than, than, than we might think. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, this one's one of my favorite slides because if you can see the red dots on this slide, there's a red dot on every year. So from 1980, all the way to 2019, every single year has a red dot. So what does that red dot even mean? It means that every single year, the market had one point in that year, whether it was in the summer or Christmas time or whatever, that year, the market went down to a negative number. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the market closed with a negative percentage that year. So if you look at this, like let's take um, 2000, uh, three, for example, uh, 2003, there's a red dot at about negative 13%. And, and the year actually closed with a positive 26%. So it, it's really important to remember that the market moves up and down a lot, just because we see a positive return at the end of the year on our statement, it doesn't necessarily mean that the whole year was was a positive year. So uh, I'm going to ask that you answer this question in the group chat, in the chat option, instead of going off mute, um, please write your answer in the chat. But Sheldon and I drafted up this question, which was, um, for example, if I have money in the stock market uh, in 2003 and the market goes down negative 12 percent and I know for sure that uh, I'm let's say I'm scared and I panic and I sell everything to cash. What is my actual loss by the end of that year? Is it negative 12% or is it 26% or is it 38%? Uh, I'm interested to know if, uh, if, if anyone cares to take a guess. Somebody said negative 13. Good, good answer. Okay, let's just see if anyone else wants to uh, add a, an answer. Negative 13 again, okay. Okay, well, maybe I'll give a 10 seconds left to see if anyone else wants to answer, but um, really think about that. Like if you, if you sell everything when the markets are at negative 13, uh, what do you lose that year, really, if the markets go up 26 by the end of the year? 39, okay. So the correct answer is 39. Um, good job. Because the truth is that if you lost 13% in, in the time that you sold, um, that might, that would, that's what we call your, um, your uh, technical loss. But the thing is that your opportunity loss is actually 26% on top of that. So in the time that the market gained a 26% recovery, you missed that round. So um, you're going to start 2004 39% behind the average investor, which is something that we as financial planners are often, often are trying to um, avoid. And we're trying to guide our clients to make sure that they don't make that mistake. So, um, and I think Sheldon's going to jump into the rest of the seminar now. Thanks for your answers. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, good, uh, good answers, everybody. So it's nice to talk about all this, but we as planners, sorry, one second, we as planners talk to our clients and ask them what was important in retirement and what does peace of mind for retirement look like to them? Because for everybody, retirement can mean different things. For some people, it means buying a house closer to the kids. For other people, it means buying a house farther away from the kids, but it really all depends. And you want to look at different variables that can set your retirement plan. These are some of the variables that we found from talking with our clients. The first one is, it's no secret that Canadians are living much, much longer than they did even a decade ago. 
that means that retirement for a lot of Canadians nowadays can last 15, 25, or even 30 years. All this extra time into the retirement requires extra planning. But the question is, is how prepared are you? With absolute confidence, are you as a pre-retiree ready? Now, I don't mean to say this to scare anybody. I mean to say this to inspire and to motivate people to take the necessary steps to gain that confidence and that clarity. Because when you look at the chart, what this chart is trying to show is the average lifespan of Canadians who are 60, 60 years old today. And it's showing that half of the individuals and couples will live beyond their respective ages, such as males are 83, females are 89. So it's very, very prudent that you plan into your 90s and a bit more beyond because you don't want to run out of money. Another thing that's very important to retirees is making sure they don't lose out on purchasing power. And what that comes down to is a concept that we call inflation. Inflation is just the rising cost of goods over a period of time. And the longer that you live, the bigger the impact inflation will have. For instance, take the slide. In the 1960s, a uh, fast food meal costed you anywhere from 50 to 60 cents. That same meal today, we go to McDonald's, it costs you 10 times as much. And today we're seeing that same sentiment in retirees. When Canadians are nearing retirement, they want to go very, very safe with their investments and they'll purchase items called GICs. I'm sure people have heard of them, but it's interest bearing investments, very, very safe, very secure. While they're good in the short term, in the longer term, they're adding big roadblocks to the retirement plan because these short-term investments don't keep pace with inflation. So you're taking your 60 cents nowadays and going back to McDonald's and trying to get a Happy Meal, but you can't do that. You need five, six dollars nowadays. And it's the same point with funds at later, at later dates in the future. Now, before we start getting really upset for this poor, poor person pushing the big boulder up a hill, let's talk about it for a second, because this can be a very livable reality to a lot of people who've entered retirement. Because when you enter retirement, you start taking out money from your retirement nest egg, the funds that you've accumulated your entire life. It makes sense. You are in retirement. You want to start living your money. You want to start living nicely. But at the beginning of your retirement, if you have a poor, if you're exposed to poor market performance, you're digging yourself a hole that you might not be able to get out of down the road. So how do you reduce this risk? Well, it's about a common term called diversification. And I'm going to talk about this in a few slides, but first what we want to talk about is this, a world of averages. It's no secret that we live in a world of averages. From the financial industry to right now, what are people's average happiness with the lockdown? We live in a world that fixated on averages. Take this example, for instance. It assumes that if you had $100,000 in your IRSP, and you took out 5%, if you took out 600 bucks, sorry, every month, and you had a 5% rate of return, you're going to run out of money at 89. Logical. That makes logical sense. You take out a certain money, you make a certain percent, you're going to run out at this point. But that's not really the reality. The reality of the things is your portfolio is subject to year to year fluctuations. One year might be negative, one year might be positive. And this can all have an effect on the plans and longevity of your retirement. This is a hypothetical situation over three years. Starting from the top, you go positive 5%, negative 15 in the bottom right, and positive 25 in the left corner. The average of all three is 5%. And yes, these are somewhat extreme numbers. We would not expect this to be in a portfolio for somebody in retirement, but it helps show a more important underlying question. Because right now, the major area of focus for a lot of people entering retirement is what is my rate of return? And while that, without a doubt, is a very, very important question, it's not the one that we should be asking all the time. Because what we should be asking is, what is the sequence of my rate of return now that I'm taking out some money from my RRSP? And let's revisit the example that we were just talking about. 
Well, if we apply that 5% average, the negative 15% being in your second year, you continue to withdraw 600 bucks, but now that money is only lasting you until 83. It changed from 89 to 83, six years. That's six years less of trips to Brazil or six years less of cruises, or right now, six years less of self-isolation. But what I'm trying to show is that even with just altering the altering the sequence of your returns, it can make quite a big impact on your retirement. Look at the counterclockwise example, where the negative 15% is in the third year, still 5% overall three years. But when we apply this to the chart of $100,000, you can now see that since negative 15 is a third year rate of return, our funds are now asking us to 87. And it might be better than the 83, but it's still not up to par with the 89 we saw from the oversimplified version of this. This is another very, very good example of this oversimplification. And we're going to show how we can get over this oversimplified thing since everybody in our industry is doing it. Well, 500,000, you take out 5% every year from the account and you're gonna run out of money at age 100. But as we saw, that's not the case because investment returns can vary. They can go up, they can go down. So that's a more accurate chart of planning this. But once again, we can't all look at one line and even though I have glasses, I still can't make out one solid line in there. But what it's trying to show is what we do at IG Wealth Management. We use a very, very interesting product, interesting analysis called the Monte Carlo analysis. And it shows a range of possible outcomes. Considering the expected rate of return in your portfolio and the expected variabilities of rates of return, we can start to stress test your plan to see how durable it is through these unforeseen market conditions. Now, remember in the earlier slides when I said that the best way to reduce market risk is diversification? Well, we're gonna talk about this right now and how we can put it to use. Because diversification works when you're saving. It's the old adage of don't put all your eggs in one basket. You spread your money across different types of businesses, different types of countries, all in hopes of avoiding being affected by a single event. In retirement, it works to diversify your income, your, your assets, not just over products and countries, but also over how you're generating income. Like having a pillar that generates income just in case for security reasons or having a pillar with flexibility because you wanna be diversified, not just across, across the world, but also across product. Now, I hope talking about all this has really, really inspired you to take the steps to achieve your confidence and clarity in your financial world. And what we want to do now is show a real life family example of a couple that sat down with Sara, myself and my team and how we put these different strategies to use and the benefit that the family saw. So let me be the first to introduce you to Nicole and Sam. Nicole is 59 years old and Sam is 58. They're wanting to retire in 2022. So that they had a few years for us to work with and they only expected a slight reduction in their living expenses, if at all. So they, they had their sights set on what they wanted to do and we had a few years to plan for it. So this is what we uncovered. Between the both of them, they had about $1.3 million in savings spread out through TFSAs, RRSPs, and non-registereds. As you can see, Nicole's non-registered is slightly bigger than Sam's. And that's because Nicole got an inheritance from her dad and they wanted to see what they could do with it because they still didn't have the confidence they had enough set aside for their lifestyle in their 90s. So we sat down with them and we uncovered their current plan that their advisor at their bank told us. The advisor at their bank gave them four very good key points that, uh, that can be used with anybody. They the advisor told them that they should start drawing on their RRSPs early. 
to avoid the high taxes to the estate. They wanted to spread that tax bite out over time and keep their marginal tax rate low so they don't have to pay back OAS to the government. And that's another concept that we can talk about at a different time. But if you make too much money, you have to pay OAS back to the government. The second thing they wanted to do is they had a son named Al. Financially speaking, Al is self-sufficient, but he didn't have any real savings or extra income. He also was in the midst of proposing to somebody that Nicole and Sam just met. So there was a bit of uncertainty there. Nicole and Sam had the intentions of transferring their cabin to Al when they retire and then pay the capital gains tax then. They also planned on continuing to pay the property taxes for their cabin because they bought a GIC with Nicole's dad's money. And the intended, the intended purpose of those funds were to use to pay for the property taxes. They also wanted to use the TFSAs for the shortfalls, like a big lump sum costs while they're in a high tax bracket. And then to talk about the planning that took place from here on out, I'm gonna have Sara speak a bit more to this and she can break it down in a bit more detail. Thanks, Sheldon. So um, I encourage everybody, uh, I know this case is a little bit complex. So if you have any questions, feel free to write your question in the chat and I'll try to get to them as we go along. Um, if your question is of a personal nature, feel free to just reach out to Sheldon or myself afterwards. Um, individually, and you can also um, message us individually in the chat. I think there's a way to do that. So, um, but for what uh, for what we did here is um, obviously we put a fake picture uh, for confidentiality, but uh, let's pretend that's Nicole and Sam. So um, the main thing we focused on when we met this couple is is it was really important for them to make sure that their son takes over the cabin. Um, they wanted to do that now, and their uh, the current advisor told them that that was that's a good idea. It's fine as long as they kept paying the um, property tax and everything every year using that GIC they have. Um, I mean, Nicole and Sam weren't really aware that the GIC income is 100% taxable, um, which we obviously knew that, and that kind of raised a little bit of a red flag for them. Uh, the other thing we knew for sure is, uh, is their son being engaged to someone that they didn't really know or feel comfortable with is a bit of a family law issue. Um, we can't really get into state planning today in this uh, webinar because it's already 4.30, and that topic is quite wide, but... Um, uh, the, the short of it is that um, the person that he's going to marry could have some stake or some um, like entitlement to what he's going to own in the future. And we wanted to avoid any type of um, marital breakdown issues or estate planning issues in the future. So uh, we kind of changed things up a little bit. And the way we started is um, we started with our typical six step process. So the first step is we basically um, put together a list and a snapshot, let's call it, of a balance sheet to find out like what is really their expenses, um, what do they need, and uh, how much of that is actually coming in for retirement income. So we did that. We wanted to uh, actually identify whether there are any gaps or not. So Little did we know, there is a huge gap. Uh, we knew for sure that Nicole and Sam spent $72,000 a year um, on expenses that they need to spend. So this is like utilities, grocery shopping, cars, like this is the stuff that they have to spend every month to live. We call these fixed expenses. We also knew that they had a pretty fun lifestyle. This couple and their friends go out a lot and they had a $40,000 annual um budget for restaurants and going out to sporting events and trips and all this stuff. So they definitely spent about 110,000 or 111,000 a year. But the problem was that the fixed income that was coming in from their retirement and the government and their, and their savings was quite below that. So with 80, 80 to $83,000 coming in and 111,000 in expensive expenses, we identified a, almost a $40,000 gap. So the, the main, the main really project for us was, okay, how can we close this gap? And then uh, can we make things even better? So if we move to the next slide, um, Sheldon, I think you have to change the slide. Sorry. I know I'm just trying. There we go. 
Okay, so if you can see this slide over here, um, we, we came up with five strategies. I'm not going to go into so much detail because I know um, I want to give you everybody some time to ask questions at the end. Um, but ma mainly the five strategies we decided to use for them, which made total sense is number one, obviously, we were going to split the pension for anyone who has a pension and doesn't know what splitting a pension is like definitely find out because it's a huge tax advantage and that saved them quite a bit of money. Um, we also decided that we didn't agree with withdrawing from the um, RSPs right away uh, or yeah with the RSPs right away because the tax bill was so high so we decided to um, postpone that to the later years. The purchase of a small annuity uh, for anyone that knows what an annuity is it's like a lifelong stream of income that comes in and we decided that that's a lot more cost effective and tax efficient than a GIC. So it still gives them a guaranteed source of income, but it's cheaper to do that. So we chose that option. Um, and then the other thing we did is we, we love tax-free saving accounts. Every financial planner you talk to will tell you the same thing. Those are the best accounts, they're tax-free. We don't have them in the States. So Canadians are very lucky to have that. And the best use of those accounts is to hold long-term and, um, growing assets in them to be able to use that tax-free uh, benefit. So we wanted to restructure the way they use tax-free saving accounts. Um, instead of using it for like an emergency, we, we decided that that's not the best use of that account. So uh, the, the, the last thing we did was um, we knew it's so important for them to move this cabin, to, to give their cabin to their son. But because we explained the family law risk and the estate planning risk and the cost of the the, the tax they would pay to move the, the, the house to their son. We decided to move the cabin to Al when they were actually like after death, which for, for many reasons, it's a benefit. And I'll, I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, I, I believe it's in the next slide. So, uh, so I'm gonna start walking you through just very quickly over what we did. So you can see um, the benefit. So the red, the red lines you see are shortfalls. And those are the shortfalls that they had before they came in. So when we decided to um, split the pension, we saved 520,000 right there. Um, there. There's the red, the red lines going down. So we're saving money as we go on. And if you go on to the next one, uh, you can see, um, uh, can you go? Yeah, there you go. This slide right here, we can see that we decided to we, this is a slide that's showing that they have a $520,000 shortfall. So um, Sheldon, I'm going to try to take control of your screen. If you can allow it. Okay. Um, just wondering if that worked. Okay, so you can see here we have 66% on the screen. What does that mean? That means that if they do nothing different than what we than what we've suggested, so if they just keep their plan the way they had it, they had a 66% chance of uh, success, which means that they had they had a pretty pretty uh, big chance of running out of money before they um, before they pass away. So we wanted to make sure that that chance goes up. So we want to do what we Sheldon said, we want to run a Monte Carlo, we want to do a crash test, we want to make sure that in any market condition, whether the market drops 20% today or 30% tomorrow, or, or inflation goes up or uh, there's a disability in the family or anything, we want to make sure that we can get that number up to at least 90%. So we so we kept going. And um, with all the changes that we made, you can see the percentage of success starts to go up. So we had an 83% chance of success by the time, um, by the time, oh, I see there's a question in the chat. I'll get to you in a second. Uh, there's an 83% chance that, uh, that of success at this point. When we decided to buy the annuity instead of the GIC, we, we went up to 89%. And then that's a very good score. We were really happy when we see that. So that's great. Um, and then the next slide. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so this one was great. Like, um, 
uh, when we decided to use the TFSAs properly, those tax-free saving accounts that are often misused, we, we, we got to a 92% chance of success, meaning they're not going to run out of money. And what that means is we, decide, we decided we can, we can save them so much tax, we can save them so much time, so much stress, and give them a in total, 95% chance of success from 66%. Uh, the, main, the main benefit here is that um, we left them with an extra million dollars at the end of the, their life in their estate for their son by following our recommendations, which was a good day for everybody. So uh, I believe that uh, that kind of sums up the case here. I'm just gonna try to get to the question in the, in here, so it's from Paula. Uh, I'm 36 years old and started working one year ago. My plan is to establish, oh, sorry. I think this is um, a different message. So uh, if anyone has any messages, please um, please uh, reach out to us in the chat and Sheldon and I can answer any of those. I don't see any questions right now, so. Yeah, so th thank you, Sarah. And to speak a bit, that was how we at IG Wealth Management tend to approach things. And I want to thank everybody for taking the time once again out of their days to lis listening to us. Sarah and I have set some time aside to answer everybody's questions. We also have our emails given to Pablo and Axel and the LCBN community. So if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. One thing that we did want to do uh, lastly with everybody is a moment of truth. So if you guys can read through this and answer as many yeses as you can to these questions. The whole, whole point of this exercise is to see how many aspects of your financial well-being are being taken care of. If you scored higher than a 10, you most likely have a good advisor, but there are room for improvement. If you scored less than six, as you can see in the bottom, it says run to a new advisor, which might be some prudent advice. I'm just joking, there's no running, everybody stay indoors. <laughs> but um, it's just to see if you are being taken care of at the fullest extent. But other than that, thank you everybody for participating in today's webinar. Pablo? Uh, Marco, I see a question in the chat um, that you wrote. Uh, if you can go off mute for a second, um, are you able to tell me what you mean by an investment instrument? Mm -hmm. uh... Marco, I'm I just unmuted you. So if you want to, uh, if you want to just give us a bit more insight into what you mean by an investment instrument, that'd be great. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, we yes, can hear you yeah. perfectly. Some uh, investment uh, companies have uh, what I call an instrument, meaning it could be mutual fund or trust fund that is composed of several companies um, that are traded in the stock market. Mm -hmm. um, some people use these these uh, vehicles to to gain uh, uh, or to leverage their their investments over the over the time. Like, or put it, let me put it the other way. How do you, uh, as an investment company, make possible that that if I have cash, I can turn it into capital gains in the mar in the stock market or with different type of investments. 
That is a very good question, Marco. And what you did just describe there of having an investment that is compiled of different companies traded on the stock market, what that is right there is called a mutual fund. And there are tons of different types of mutual funds that are fitted for everybody's specific situations. So for instance, there is a Canadian diversified mutual fund, big name, I know. But what it means is it's investing only in companies that are based in Canada. Now, outside of that, then you have a risk profile, which determines how much risk you're willing to take, whether you want to be exposed fully into the market or you want to have a bit of cash left over that's a bit more secure. It's all very, very determined on your situation. So it, we would like to take a look and see what else there is out there. Sorry if you had anything else you wanted to add to that. Uh, I, I agree with you, Sheldon. I think that's right. Um, the, the real the real question with diversification is always like everybody always asks us, you know, like, is this too diversified or am I not diversified enough? And, and the real answer is it really depends on what your goal is. It really depends on what your timeline is. Um, we have clients that have a 30 year timeline, a very high aggressive risk profile, and they're going to have a different level of diversification than someone who has an opposite uh, portfolio or basically lifestyle or structure so it's a very case by case but at ig we do have access to some of the best sub advisors in the world um and we do have a very very wide range of products available so if we're talking about products um i don't think there's anything we don't have with the exception of maybe a few uh, uh higher risk commodities that i would say most people don't have so um i hope that answers your question are there any other questions from anybody? Uh, yeah, that's. What is the min? Uh, do you mean the minimum? Yeah, uh, Marco, if you're speaking with minimum investment or do you mean minimum like timeline? Minimum to invest, okay. So did you want to speak to that or? Sure, if you want, yeah. Um, we, yeah. We, uh, we have, a, our team has a little bit of a specific uh, scenario. We, we don't really have an investment minimum um, for the sake of planning. So we do, we don't like to turn anyone away. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, we're not gonna, we're not gonna refuse to help anybody uh, just because they don't have a certain amount of assets. Our average clients are sitting between a hundred and 250,000. Um, but like I said, that's an average, just like you saw the 5% average, it doesn't necessarily mean everybody's in that boat. So if we do meet with someone that has less than that or more than that, we're not going to turn anybody away uh, necessarily. Mm -hmm. yeah. no That's problem, great because I have a, I have a hundred dollars to invest. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> you never no, know. They, yeah, you never know, right? Well, um, on behalf of Latin Coover and the Latin Canadian Business Network, I would love to thank you, Sheldon and Sarah, for giving us this great uh, keynote and all these insights that will put. Uh, all of us to save for our retirement. Is, no problem. Is, Thank is you there for anything having else you you would like to add? Uh, your contact information or something for people um, who are interested. I did give my contact info. It was at the last slide. Axel and the entire LCBN have my contact information, but uh, my email is just Sheldon at ig ca. I'll put it in the chat as well. One thing I did want to say is right now is unprecedented times. We're all trying to kind of get through this together. Sara and myself have plenty of information surrounding the COVID-19 relief packages and what to apply for and how to apply for it. So if you guys would like that information, feel free to reach out to Pablo Axel or the LCBN community or give myself a straight up email and we'd be more than happy to provide some clarity on that aspect as well. Yeah, definitely. I would encourage that. Um, I would encourage anyone to reach out if they're not sure about their situation. Uh, we definitely have the time and the space for you. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
And also, uh, don't forget to sign up uh, for our newsletter for the LCBN um, network as well uh, at uh, lcbn.ca if you want to be part of the Latin Canadian Business Network who is hosting this uh, webinar. And thank you so much, guys. I, I have a question. Um, when you were mentioning this Canadian only, when you're investing only in Canadian companies, uh, can you choose, you know, these trends of like investing in clean energy or in environmentally conscious companies, or is there a way to, to also pick to be only in that sector or it's more of a mix? Uh, very good question. We definitely have those. We definitely have environmentally uh, friendly funds. We have a whole list of sustainable funds. Um, we do have we do have the ability to customize portfolios the way a client wants us to. Um, most of the time, we we ask that the client follows our recommendation because we're trying to do do certain things by cutting the cost for the client uh, of investing. We're trying to maximize their return over the long run, etc. But we can definitely um, customize certain things like that. So we we do have a lot of clients that prefer to leave out certain stocks or or leave out certain industries um, like I have a client that wants to have no investment in Japan tobacco we can make that happen so it, it really just depends on the client and, and their timeline and what they want great mm. um, so uh, check out lcbn.ca for our we weekly webinar uh, thanks so much for IG um, wealth management for you're welcome for thank, you for, having thank us. you for having us thank you guys Thanks for being here and thanks to everyone who uh, tuned in on Facebook and on Zoom. See you in the next webinar. Thank you.